Hey, good morning everybody, it's Brian with Team Aquascape. This is gonna be kind of a different addition to our normal videos, and it was all inspired by not one customer, but maybe like a 100 customers. For years and years and years, customers have always been asking my opinion on what would be some great plants to put around a pond. And even though I don't have a horticulture degree, I've never worked at a garden center, or we even do landscape, I tend to pick up a lot and remember a lot about the plants because to me, the plants always, always, always make or break our entire project. I have strong opinions on what plants make sense. And for some reason, a lot of people, even professional landscapers out there, are very, very talented with landscape. But when they get around water, for some reason, they just kind of freeze up. And I think the key with landscaping around a water feature is to plant it in a way that you can't tell exactly where the water ends and where the land begins. And so there's a trick to that. And not really, I mean, it's actually kind of simple. You just look for low, lower growing, spreading type plants. I thought the easiest way to show you guys this is just to kind of take you around my personal pond, show you some of my favorite plants and what I've done with mine, and then we'll go from there. project we're going to start with is my front yard water feature. Now, if you remember, I built this with my youngest daughter, Grace, last fall. It was right around Halloween, I think, because I kind of remember trick-or-treaters coming in or us trying to get it done by Halloween. Let's turn this camera around, show you how I've landscaped this. I'm hoping it to look like later in the season. You know, it's only April, so not everything's totally leafed out, but we still have some color and it's going to look even better and better in the summer. In fact, I think I'll bring you back in the summer to show you exactly what it looks like, but here we go. So right in here, we've just got some daffodils. Now daffodils are a pretty simple plant, but what I love about the daffodils is just we get that pop of spring color. And so whether you're doing daffodils or we've got some tulips inside this container, and this container is on top of my pump vault, hiding my pump vault, but I just want some of that spring color. Later, this stuff is gonna switch out. I've got a hosta coming up right in there. So as those start dying back, then that hosta will kind of fill up this whole area. As these tulips go down, then I'll replace this with just some other annuals to give me summer color but the plants I really, really like in here are some of these sedums. So these are just low growing sedums. There's a mixed bunch of sedums. In fact, you can see the root mass here. This came at, sold as a mixed sedum collection. You got some hens and chicks in there. You got some different sedums and I'm never gonna know all the names of these things. But if you go to any garden center and just ask for low growing sedums, they're usually sold in flats. In fact, this is how they're sold. You have these different plugs. And what I love about them is sedums don't require a whole lot of water or care. They're super resilient to different weather, drought resistant, and they just survive. In fact, I'll, when we go in the backyard, I'll show you how they're just growing out of the cracks of rocks and joints in the patio and stuff. They're really, really resistant. Here's an area, just some coral bells. Same thing with coral bells. There's so many varieties now. You have that bright yellow, you have pinks, you have deep reds, you have darker reds, bright reds. There's so many different varieties, but I love them because the color stays there most of the winter. It doesn't really really die back all the way and they're super easy to take care of and that pop of yellow just looks fantastic and then as we come up we always kind of do layers and what I was trying to do is soften up this wall and also I want to scale down the frog over here so Japanese maples just tend to be a signature plant around every pond not too many ponds I know of that don't have some type of Japanese maple and there's so many cool varieties this is called ice dragon and it gets about the size of like crimson queen it'll get a little bit more of a spread on it, it might come all the way out to here but it won't get much taller than maybe three to four feet tall so it's gonna be a perfect plant especially as it starts coming in over in here and I can't wait to see that thing completely leaf out and then we just have a simple boxwood over here boxwoods are about as simple as you get super easy to maintain not much to them you can trim them back keep them at whatever height you want but for me it was really important to keep something green here especially for the winter and the fall I didn't want this to look naked the rest of the season and then of course I've got a bigger weeping white pine sitting back 
back here. I love the weepy stuff. You're gonna see that more and more as we get into the backyard. But to me, these are great. I love the way it kind of cascades over the frog, almost creating part of a picture frame. And as that Japanese maple back in there starts filling out, it really will frame out that whole frog. So those are just some plants in the front. Something to be said about bulbs too. A trick a customer told me years and years ago is something with the bulbs. I was just blown away with her backyard, especially in the spring. I mean, it wasn't like a couple bulbs. She had thousands and thousands and thousands of bulbs. And she said what her grandma had told her years and years ago was, hey, every year, make it a point to buy 10 bulbs, 20 bulbs, 50 bulbs, 100 bulbs, whatever you can afford. And I can't really afford a thousand bulbs a year, but I can't afford 20 to 50 bulbs a year. And I just budget for it. And every year I try to plant 20 to 50 more. And soon enough, you know, you multiply that by 10 years, 50 bulbs bulbs times 10 years, you're gonna have 500 bulbs all over your property. That's kind of what I've been doing now. We've got some daffodils and tulips here. You can see all the tulips coming up over here. Let's not forget the most important part of every morning, but we got a bunch of tulips coming up over there. I've got a bunch in the front yard too. This is actually another really cool Japanese maple. It's called Shiraz. It gets a little taller. Won't get nearly as big as like a blood good Japanese maple, but it has more of a pink variegated leaf, which is really cool. You can see a weeping red bud flowering back over here. I love the red buds. Some landscapers call them dead buds because they don't have a whole lot of success growing them, but I have three of them in my yard and they've been doing really, really well. And what I like about the red buds is the flower holds on it a whole lot longer than let's say like a magnolia or a pear tree or something like that. Here's some of those other coral bells. You can see the different leaf, kind of that deeper color. Another type of Japanese maple. It's called the North Wind. Look it up. North Wind Japanese maple. Super, super super hardy, can tolerate a whole lot more sun, way more cold resistant. And speaking of cold resistant, we're in a zone like 4B. Sometimes we can get like a zone five plant to survive if it's a little bit more protected. But all of you guys that are watching this that are down south, let's say in a zone six, seven there, a lot of these plants are more cold hardy than uh, a zone six. I know some of you guys that live like out east coast, New York and stuff, can have a whole lot more luck with like Japanese maples and rhododendron and we can't get the same variety of that stuff here. But let's move into the backyard. I'll show you some of the plants in the backyard and we'll just kind of let this thing happen organically. All right, so as we move into the backyard here, none of these plants are even by the pond, but I can't help but show them off a little bit. I work a lot with Matt Zerby from Wasco Nursery, and I would say most of my education and plant materials probably come from that guy. I love picking his brain. I love walking his garden center. Any of you guys that really wanna just start learning about plants, find a local garden center and just start walking around it and looking at the tags and is this drought resistant? Is this full sun? Is it partial sun? Is it full shade, partial shade, all those types of things. How big do they get? And that's really how I started learning about it. I just kept visiting garden center after garden center after garden center. And Wasco Nursery out there just west of St. Charles, Illinois, is one of my favorite all-time garden centers in the world. Huge, huge, huge selection of plants. Unbelievable staff. Matt's taught me so much about what I know about the plants. He's always willing just to kind of lend an ear and walk me through some of the problems and troubles I've had with my own yard. And we've done a lot of great stuff and collaborated on many many projects together in fact he's even got a Facebook thing that he does every Saturday morning I believe it's facebook.com forward slash Wasco nursery check it out say Brian sent you from Aquascape and tell him what you think so at this point let's just take you kind of through the backyard I'm gonna go over all the different plants I've got back here some of them are by the pond some of them are away from the pond but hopefully it inspires you I know plants inspire me and like I said they make or break every project so we'll start off with just these first two right by the entrance here. This is a super cool plant. This is a Japanese maple. It's actually called sumagaki, which means painted fingernails. And you can see these leaves, how awesome they are. A super slow growing Japanese maple doesn't get extremely tall in our zone. I think it'll max out at like 10, 15 feet tall, but I've had this thing for, I don't know, 10-ish years. And it grows like maybe an inch or two a year. So it's a pretty slow growing Japanese maple, but really fills out nice. Love that color and the contrast. Another great one that totally leafed out 
yet. And these are all shade tolerant, or what I could call filtered sun. You can see I've got a big giant maple tree above me. And as it leafs out, and the other tree over there, which is a honey locust tree, as those leaf out, they provide a lot more shade in here, but it's filtered shade. So we still get a little bit of sun coming in. But this is a great one. This is an oak leaf hydrangea. You can see the new leaves are just about to come out, but those leaves will be bigger than my hand, every single one. And the flowers are about twice the size, but love shade, can tolerate a lot. And I just keep cutting them back and kind of training them how to grow. They're surrounding the rabbit cage that sits over here. And then as it leaves out, the rabbit cage doesn't become such a dominant thing as we enter into the backyard over here. As we continue to move around, we've got a Canadian hemlock. Hemlocks, again, will tolerate full sun to shade. A great evergreen if you've got a shady backyard. And a trick that Wasco told me to do is just keep giving this thing a haircut. Oh, speaking of rabbits, huh? Which one's this, mocha? Yes. <laughs> but we've got the green Canadian hemlock here. Great, great tree for shaded gardens. And if you give it a haircut, it kind of stays more compact and dense and it would hold its shape a whole lot more. So every year I just kind of give it a haircut and keep trimming it up, trimming it up. This year I got to cut a little bit more off the top, but it's getting kind of tall. Right now it's probably someplace in the 15 foot range. As we move around over here, we've got an Appalachian red bud. You're going to notice the difference on that pink versus your Eastern red bud, which has more subtle pink. Super bright, vibrant colors. Love the red buds just because it holds the flower so much longer than a lot of your other flowering trees, especially compared to like a magnolia or a service berry or even like a pear tree or something. All right, so let's kind of keep moving around over here. Now we get more into the pond. And remember when we talked up front about those sedums, those succulents, this is a different variety of sedum up in here. And you can see how this stuff is literally just growing out of the cracks. I mean, look at that, there's like nothing in there. It's just gravel and it's just growing right out of the cracks and the joints in between these stairs. Here's a different variety here. And there's tons and tons of varieties. As I'm talking about the names, they're gonna be the more common names, like sedums or hostas or Japanese maple, oak leaf hydrangea, I'm red bud. I'm sure there's scientific names or Latin names for all of those, and I just don't know them. So I'll give you the common names, and that's just because that's how I know them and how I can relate to them to customers. If we move over here. I actually planted this tree for the girl for the bunny back over there. It's a Louisa crab apple, and for each one of the kids, we planted a tree, but this is not just a normal Louisa crab apple. This came from Wasco Nursery again. It's a contorted Louisa crab apple. You can see that twisted trunk. So it was actually trained to kind of twist and I've continued to train it and create different shapes and stuff with it. It's a great flowering tree. It's extremely fragrant. You can smell those flowers from about a hundred feet away, but it looks fantastic this time of year. Those flowers will probably hold for about two to three weeks before they finally start dropping. Just behind it, our weeping Alaskan cedars. It's a fantastic tree. They're just like magnificent. They're just, they get so big. They're really tall. It's probably really close to its max height at 20, 25 feet tall. But at night, these things look just absolutely amazing all planted up. And I have three of them planted together just to kind of increase the overall size of them. But they can be planted in uh, partial sun too. They don't need full sun, but they're doing great up on this well-drained berm over here. All evergreens tend to do a whole lot better raised up a little bit. If you think about it, they're plant, you know, they come from the mountains and hillsides, so they want well-drained soil. But let's move down now into the pond. So we talked about some different sedums, succulents that can grow hens and chicks, that kind of stuff. This is a juniper. It's called Pacific Blue. It has a much softer needle on it than your typical juniper. A little bit more bluish color as that new growth starts coming out. And you can see how it's just kind of creeping over the rocks. If we can find some old photos of the pond, you'll see how big this has actually gotten as it just kind of starts engulfing this big giant massive boulder here. And like I said earlier, we love when we can't tell exactly where the water ends and where the land begins. So you got a different type of juniper sitting over here. It's just a low growing spreading juniper. That's one plant right there. So you can see how much it's actually grown. Got another evergreen over here. If you can see this trend, I really like Japanese maples and evergreens, but this is called a hillside creeper. And that thing has gotten really big in the last 10 years, but it stays super low to the ground like its name it's kind of a planted on a hillside and it just slowly creeps and creeps and every year i just kind of cut it back and keep it managed into here if i wasn't cutting it back that thing would be all the way back out over into here all right 
guys, well that was fun. Thanks so much for joining me. I know that's gotta be so much to take in. It's really not that big of a yard, but there are a lot of plants, you know, and I kind of just rattled off this name and that name and this name. Do me a favor. We're gonna turn this into a two-part series because I know how much you guys love two-part series. But tell me, tell me what you liked about this. Is it worthwhile to me to do this? Landscape around the pond, plants to help beautify your water feature? And if so, what was your favorite part? If there's something I missed and went over too fast, I can always repeat it. Maybe we go to another yard and we show you some different types of landscape and some of my other favorite plants that of course I don't have in my small backyard. Look forward to seeing you guys next episode where we finish off the tour of plants around the pond. Hey, you guys know the routine. Share, like, comment, subscribe, and we'll keep doing this. Thanks so much, bye.